what I'm going to try to do over the next 25 minutes is kind of wrap up or summarize the work that we have been doing over the last two years at the Rockefeller University in um, what was a really big collaborative effort with many other labs involved. Uh, and as Eric mentioned, my topic will be the humoral immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 infection or vaccination. And so now that we're heading into year three of this um, pandemic, I'm losing track where we are. Uh, I'm losing track which, which year things happen. So I'm gonna use this timeline to mainly guide myself through this talk, but also hopefully uh, guide you through this talk a little bit. And as we all know, towards the end of 2019, early 2020, SARS-CoV-2 started circulating widely, first in the EU, then made the leap into um, the US. And uh, a colleague of mine, Davide Robiani, um, in early January, like in end of January, early February, had the foresight um, of what this virus might grow into and already started working on a clinical protocol and got an IRB approval um, for the enrollment of individuals who recovered from COVID-19. And then when I think every one of us, uh, the entire world recognized um, the scope of this, um, this little virus and the disease it's causing, um, uh, when on March 11, the WHO declared a global pandemic, we were ready with this clinical protocol in place um, to start working and um, do a clinical research study looking at rec recovered individuals. And so this is what we then did. Uh, so from April 1st to May 8th, we started enrolling individuals. And <clears throat> if, you remember, if you've been in New York at the time, and uh, you might remember these very eerie weeks, um, days, uh, it was a nice spring actually, but the city was in lockdown, or university was in lockdown. <clears throat> but April 1st was the first day that uh, and a recovered individual walked through our doors. Here's a picture of the Rockefeller University Hospital. And there were so many question marks back then. Uh, and lucky for us, we have great, great um, scientists and collaborators at the university. And two of them, Paul Vienage and Theodora Hatsinyau, uh, two virologists with their labs, started working um, early on um, to set up assays um, that would allow us to measure SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing activity in plasmas of recovered individuals. So when these individuals walked through our doors and we enrolled um, in, in a couple of weeks, uh, over 150 of them, it was very interesting for us uh, to, to get an idea of how plasma neutralizing activity against this virus would look like after individuals recovered. And so one early observation that we had, and you see here on the y-axis different individuals, on the x-axis neutralization titers, uh, an early observation that we had is that only a, a small fraction of individuals really reached high uh, neutralizing titers after infection, with most of them rather showing moderate neutralizing activity and, and quite a large fraction showing uh, barely detectable levels of neutralizing activity um, uh, after infection. So that was one interesting observation that we had early, but we then wanted to go on and um, look more in detail, look on a molecular level and study antibody repertoires, B cell repertoires of these individuals. So what we did is we selected individuals with very high neutralizing activity, then some with more moderate and some with barely detectable levels. And then we applied techniques um, to um, isolate uh, individual B cells. And these techniques have been uh, established at Rockefeller University in Michelle Nussenzweig's lab um, roughly 10 years ago and have been used um, initially for the study of HIV, anti-HIV antibodies. And just to, to give you a quick um, summary how these studies look like. So it all starts with um, a blood draw or a leukophoresis sample. In our case, um, the logistics were not as such that we could do um, many leukophoresis samples, but a large blood draw usually is enough. So we asked our uh, individuals for a blood draw. From the blood draw, then we isolate um, B cells, and then we look very specifically for memory B cells against SARS-CoV-2. So among the pool of, um, uh, of all the B cells, all memory B cells, we're then single cell sorting SARS-CoV-2 specific B cells. And the way we do this is we use a, a part of the virus, a viral protein. In our case, we use the receptor binding domain. We fluorescently label it, and then we use a cell sorter um, that can help us individually sort um, memory B cells into a 96 well plate. So in each well, there's only one B cell um, that, with, that bound the bait and then um, uh, would hopefully be SARS-CoV-2 specific. When we have them isolated, we can then um, do PCRs and amplify the genetic material. So amplify heavy and light chain genes of these B cells. We can then go on and sequence. So we can already learn something about the antibody repertoire but we do not stop there. We can then clone um, heavy and light chain genes into expression vectors uh, 
um, then transfect an either adherent or a suspension cell line and produce those antibodies. Uh, and when we have those monoclonal antibodies, then we can functionally characterize them or structurally characterize them. And so um, the first sorts, I showed you a picture of April 1st. Um, everything went very quick back then on April 2nd, we had the first um, sorts. And then just a couple of days later, um, we had our first sequence information. And so this is just a sequence alignment. And without going into the details, um, what we found was that across different individuals, we found highly related antibody sequences. And that was very interesting to see because such a, um, or such a degree of similarity um, uh, between different individuals and different antibodies, um, we had not seen before, even in other viral diseases such as Zika or hepatitis B. And it was also interesting that these, these recurrent antibodies um, were not unique to those that had very high plasma nucleolizing activities, um, but also uh, among those that had almost barely detectable plasma neutralizing activities. And so when we then saw this convergent evolution across different individuals uh, that almost had identical antibodies, um, uh, it led us to believe um, and assume that a vaccine designed to elicit such antibodies could be broadly effective. And remember, this was in May, June, 2020. So long before we would receive the first um, clinical trial data out of um, the first vaccine trials that were that had been the mRNA vaccines, but I think lucky for us, um, it actually um, held up our assumption um, that we um, were able to, to get highly effect um, effective vaccines. But not only this, as I mentioned, we are with these techniques, we're able to um, uh, isolate and um, produce antibodies that we can then functionally characterize. Uh, and we were able to identify highly potent anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies um, that show high neutralizing activity in the nanogram range against SARS-CoV-2 pseudovirus, but also authentic virus. And two of them with the highest neutralizing activity um, were very interesting for us, C-135 and C-144. And so we asked uh, our colleagues, and I mean, the lineup today of this symposia is really amazing, and Dr. Bjorkman will talk later this, this morning, so I don't want to take anything away because she was the one who did this work uh, of structurally characterizing our antibodies, but also not only our antibodies, but many anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. And uh, a postdoc in her lab, Christopher Barnes, who's, who's now um, having his own lab at Stanford, um, uh, then um, developed this way of, structure, of, of structurally classifying different types of um, antibodies based on the, way they, um, uh, on the way they recognize the RBD. So in gray here in the middle, you see the receptor binding domain, which is the target of these antibodies. And then you see different ways of recognizing these. And the two antibodies that we isolated in our lab C144 is a so-called class two antibody, which binds at the top of the receptor binding domain and interferes with um, uh, the interaction of the receptor binding domain with the cellular receptor ACE2. And then we had another one, um, so not an overlapping epitope um, of a class three antibody that bound more towards the base of this receptor binding domain. So these were interesting antibodies for us. Uh, and again, this was um, towards the end of the spring of 2020 uh, when we, when we already had um, these interesting results. Unfortunately, these were also um, uh, already marked like this grim milestone of 100,000 deaths um, in the US alone uh, towards the end of May. Uh, and then although the summer was fairly, um, um, or, or showed fairly low infection rates, at least in the Northeast of this country, um, still towards the end of the fall, um, 200,000 deaths in the US alone were reached. And back then, there were a lot of questions regarding the durability and the longevity of um, immune responses after SARS-CoV-2 infection. So for us, it was the logical thing um, to ask the, the individuals that we enrolled um, six months earlier to ask them back um, for another blood draw uh, and follow them up and, and see how um, uh, durability of the immune responses after infection um, holds up. And so when we did this, um, we were, um, maybe we were not surprised because it was um, pretty much expected, but what we found is that plasma neutralizing activity after six months um, dropped quite significantly. So the red um, dots, you see plasma neutralizing activity of an individual after six months, and in the blue dot, um, uh, you see the corresponding plasma neutralizing activity after 1.3 months. So what we saw is quite a steep decrease, uh, which was again uh, expected. However, the decrease was still proportional to the initial levels. In contrast to that, when we looked at um, SARS-CoV-2 specific memory B cells, over time we saw stable levels and even a slight increase. 
And another observation was that we found um, quite a steep increase in um, somatic hypermutation. So antibody heavy and light chain genes accumulated quite a lot of um, mutations over time um, through affinity maturation. <clears throat> So another, so again, this was towards September, October of 2020. And uh, again, our collaborators, Paul Binash and Theodora Hatzinyau and the postdoc Giska Weisblum in their lab, um, um, in the meanwhile had performed selection experiments using plasma from our recovered individuals uh, and, and showing what escape mutations um, SARS-CoV-2 would come up with when um, it's challenged with plasma from infected individuals. And again, this was, um, before I think we, we widely saw um, the occurrence of naturally um, spreading viral variants. However, in the selection experiments, um, what Yiska already found were escape mutations that we then later on would all appreciate um, as they would show up um, across many, many different viral variants. So position 484, 346, um, 43944, all these sound now very familiar because we know them from uh, circulating viral variants, but back then, um, they were already they already showed up in selection experiments. And one interesting observation that we had, so we were interested in looking um, if these affinity maturation processes, how they affected the antibodies that we isolated after six months. And it was very impressive to see here on the right, you see a clonal pair of antibodies. So one antibody that we isolated after one month and then a clonal derivative, so a clonal sibling of this antibody that we isolated after six months where the, the younger antibody that was isolated after one month showed almost no neutralizing activity against different viral uh, variant mutations and escape mutations, we saw that this affinity matured antibody after six months uh, was able to potently neutralize all of them. So we saw that affinity maturation of these antibodies conferred potency and neutralizing breath and hence resilience to viral escape mutations over time. And so another important question was, um, why do we see these continuing affinity maturation after SARS-CoV-2 infection? Uh, and there are many explanations for this, and they're not mutually exclusive. So of course, it can be long with germinal centers, it can be long antigen presentation on um, follicular dendritic cells. But another interesting observation um, was made by another collaborator of us, um, Surab Mohandru, who's a gastroenterologist at Mount Sinai. And what he did in the summer of 2020, so after the first wave of COVID uh, went over New York City and New York City came out of a lockdown and re more regular procedures could take place in the hospitals again. So he had regular endoscopies and a lot of his patients um, had been infected with um, SARS-CoV-2 and had COVID-19 in the first wave. So when he then um, took intestinal biopsies during these regular endoscopies, um, as a research project, he would um, stain some of these biopsies for um, SARS-CoV-2 specific proteins. And to his surprise and to our surprise, in roughly half of these individuals that had recovered, he would still detect SARS-CoV-2 nucleoproteins, for example, in um, the, the intestinal mucosa. So signs of antigen persistence and potentially even ongoing viral replication, although these individuals had um, been symptom-free and had recovered, um, almost four months ago and had been also to get this procedure done, had to be PCR negative, at least um, by nasopharyngeal swab uh, at the time of the procedure. And that might be this, this type of antigen persistence might also play a role in this um, high levels of accumulation of somatic hypermutation and ongoing affinity maturation. <clears throat> so then um, we are toward, or we, we got towards the end of 2020. Unfortunately, again, 300,000 deaths were recorded, but it was also um, a day of optimism, December 14th, because shortly before um, the FDA had granted emergency use authorization for the mRNA vaccines, so the first non trial vaccinations started in the US. And logically for us, um, we then became very interested in studying also immune responses following SARS CoV 2 immunization. So we set it up, we set up another cohort of vaccinated individuals in December, January, and started looking at their immune response following vaccination. And so what we um, found initially, what was very encouraging, um, so here in the left plot, again, you see plasma neutralizing activity, comparing covalescence after one month, covalescence after six months. When we looked at individuals who received two doses of the mRNA vaccines, we saw almost equivalent levels of plasma neutralizing activity, 
um, uh, in those individuals when we compared them to covalescent individuals. And then here on the right side, um, this, this might look complicated, but it's um, actually not um, that complicated. So these lines in the circle plot, what they show is in, like, um, antibody repertoire overlap or identical antibody sequences across different individuals. When you see those in red and black, those are individuals who were immunized with an mRNA vaccine. And in green, you see individuals who had recovered and as you can see, it's, it's like a spider web between all of these. So we saw um, a high degree of overlap uh, of in the antibody repertoire um, among covalescent and vaccinated individuals, which was also a very encouraging sign um, for the effectiveness of um, these vaccines. Then um, the rate of, um, um, of infections and uh, subsequently death um, unfortunately picked up um, uh, in this quite drastic winter wave of 2021. And by February 22, 500,000 deaths in the US alone were recorded. And that already brought us close to a one year mark of um, the individuals that we had in, initially enrolled uh, one year earlier. And we were still very much interested in studying the durability and the longevity of immune responses following SARS-CoV-2 infection. So again, we brought our cohort back and started um, analyzing their immune responses. So on the left side, you see, again, plasma neutralizing activities over time. What we appreciated then, or what we saw was that, uh, although we saw this initial steep decline from one month to six months, uh, it flattened out between six months and 12 months and stayed pretty much stable um, plasma neutralizing activity. However, in the individuals that um, had received um, a, a vaccine in the meanwhile, we saw um, a steep increase in plasma neutralizing activity, roughly 50 fold. So a boosting of individuals who had recovered through and vaccination was very impressive to see um, uh, with this 50-fold increase. Again, we also saw continued um, accumulation of somatic hypermutation, so a continued affinity maturation at 12 months. Uh, and as a result of that, um, we also saw continued improvement of antibody potency in individuals, uh, not only between 1.3 and 6 months, um, but it continued improvements in potency um, after SARS-CoV-2 infection. <clears throat> then um, Delta entered um, the picture um, towards the summer of 2021. Uh, and um, another interesting question then um, was the longevity, not after infection, but the longevity of the immune response after vaccination. And um, so we, what we did is we asked our uh, other cohort, so the immunized cohort, um, back after five to six months um, um, into our hospital to get another blood draw and start looking into um, their immune responses um, over time. And so what we found here and on the left side, again, I'm showing this plot where we look at individual monoclonal antibodies and their um, development over time. So from one month to 6.2 months, we saw this improvement. So when we looked at immunized individuals, uh, and so here we have one additional step. So we saw monoclonal antibodies after first vaccine dose, then after the second vaccine dose, which was very comparable to covalescence after one month after infection. However, when we then looked at the development over time, um, we did not see the same, we still saw an improvement in potency, antibody potency over time. However, uh, it was not as, um, uh, not as steep as uh, what we had seen for uh, covalescent individuals. So that was one interesting observation. And when we then went on to um, look at the neutralizing, um, neutralization breadth uh, between covalescent individuals and vaccinated individuals over time, um, we saw a similar picture. And so what you see here, on the top panel is covalescent individuals um, and on the bottom panel, the vaccinated ones. And the rectangle represents um, a comparison or a ratio of clonal pairs. Um, and then we have different viral mutations, viral escape mutations that are present in different viral variants. Um, so representing a test for neutralizing breath. Uh, and so this um, shows neutralizing um, um, improvements or um, if there were no improvements, stable neutralizing activity between clonal pairs that were, that were isolated at a first time point and the second time point. So whenever over time there was an improvement in neutralizing potency against some of those viral escape mutations, um, we're showing a green square. Whenever there was no change, we're showing it in yellow. Uh, 
And when there was um, uh, actually a decrease in neutralizing potency over time uh, in the antibodies that was isolated at the second time point, um, we showed it in red. What you might appreciate is that over time in our covalescent individuals, we see many more green rectangles. So overall, an, an, a stronger increase in neutralizing breath in our covalescent individuals compared to vaccinated individuals. And um, the reason for this is, I think, a, still an open question, but a very interesting one. Uh, it, it can have uh, multiple reasons, uh, antigenic diversity um, compared from an infection to a vaccination, routes of antigenic exposure, so mucosal um, exposure to intramuscular exposure, um, maybe antigen persistence could play a role. I think it's, a, it's an interesting observation and something that uh, we need to study further. And then towards the end of 2021, um, our collaborators, Paul Binash and Theodora Hatzinyao and Fabian Schmidt, a postdoc in their lab, um, reported another um, very interesting study um, uh, that later on became, I think, very important. And so what Fabian did uh, is he, again, performed selection experiments. So plasma um, selection experiments using plasma from either uh, immunized or covalescent individuals and looked for occurring um, escape mutations. And then he also looked at this that he would found um, in circulating variants of concern. And what he then did is basically create a, a synthetic polymutant spike protein. So in a way, a worst case scenario of SARS-CoV-2 that would still be infectious. This was all in the pseudovirus backbone, so not the real virus. But he would put all of these escape mutations together, overall 20 uh, amino acid changes in um, the spike protein, and then um, test this so-called PMS20 polymutant spike protein for um, uh, resistance or immune evasion to um, plasma antibodies. And what was um, uh, interesting and a little concerning to see was when you see here um, plasma, different plasmas from um, covalescent individuals and here from vaccinated individuals, and the, the black, uh, the gray um, dots are plasma neutralizing activity against the Wuhan original strain. So you see good plasma neutralizing activity. However, when we tested then this um, polymutant spike, um, there was almost near complete resistance to um, plasmas from covalescent individuals and also from immunized individuals. However, there was one silver lining when he looked at plasmas from individuals that had been infected and then vaccinated, so ITV infected then vaccinated. Um, these individuals with the so-called hybrid immunity were actually able, the red dots, um, to exhibit some um, form of plasma neutralizing activity against um, uh, even this polymutant spike protein. So broader and more potent response in those individuals that had um, more antigenic exposures over time. And why um, do I mention- Christian, it's a two minute warning. Okay. Why do I mention this specifically? Um, so towards uh, October, uh, unfortunately, 700,000 deaths were reached. So the, the numbers kept climbing up. And then in November, um, um, uh, to I think um, maybe not everyone's surprise, but another circulating variant um, uh, entered the picture. And uh, Dr. Moore is going to speak right after me. So I don't want to take anything away because she's the expert and thanks. Um, to her and her colleagues, um, uh, the scientific community found out early about Omicron. But when we saw the sequence of Omicron and we compared it to this um, synthetic polymutant spike protein, um, it was very interesting to see that um, this then later on called Omicron actually accumulated um, over 30, I think 32 amino acid changes in the spike protein compared to this PMS20 polymutant spike, spike with 20 um, mutations. And I think then um, knowing our results from um, this PMS20 um, synthetic spike protein, uh, it came um, or it wasn't such a big surprise when, when um, then Fabian and Paul and Theodora again looked at plasma neutralizing activity against Omicron um, that we also saw that plasma neutralizing activity in covalescent individuals and in vaccinated individuals um, showed high levels um, or Omicron showed high levels of resistance to those. But then again, uh, individuals that had been infected then vaccinated um, did indeed show some uh, level of neutralization and also individuals who had a, a third vaccine dose showed some levels of immunization and this is um, just a what another way of showing these data so we saw increases after vaccination in infected individuals and some uh, residual um, activity against omicron 
<clears throat> but I think um, Dr. Moore, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this talk. We'll talk more in depth about this. So here we are headed into year three of the pandemic. Um, there are many, many open questions, uh, I think. Uh, and it's great to see the symposia that so many um, important and great minds are working on these questions. And um, we're looking forward to hearing the rest of this, this session uh, and working on these problems. This was a big collaborative effort. Um, there are many, many people to thank. Um, uh, the entire Nussenzweig lab, Paul Binash, the Rice lab at Rockefeller, but also um, uh, collaborators across the country, um, uh, Pamela Bjorkman's lab, Christopher Barnes, the entire clinical team at Rockefeller University. Um, uh, so thank you very much, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, do we have any questions from uh, attendees? And I will go ahead and, and jump off here and get, get one started. And that's the question related to um, affinity maturation in, in patients who are sort of naturally infected versus patients who are vaccinated. Um, in, in the case of the natural infection, is there evidence for anything other than the nucleocapsid protein sort of in these, these months after infection in these patients? Um, yes. Is, is there actual virus still hanging around? Yeah, so in our case, um, we were able to um, also isolate viral RNA from mucosal oh. tissues. Um, there have been studies, and I think this is... so. This, how long after, after infection is that? That was on average four months after infection. Um, but I think there are now studies that even have shown um, at least viral fragments or viral RNA uh, longer out. There has been a recent preprint that showed viral persistence throughout many organ systems, and there, there have been accumulating quite a lot of them. These were post-mortem, uh, but it, there was really widespread viral um, persistence um, in, in, in many, many different organ systems. So we also um, found viral RNA um, in the mucosal tissues. Um, uh, we also saw signs for um, uh, by electron microscopy, even for intact virions, and it's it's, it's actually even hard because the mucosal lining, the mucosal um, epithelia is, is, an, is a very active um, tissue uh, which with a lot of overturn. So it's hard to, to think that a viral protein would just stick around there if, if there's not any form of at least refueling of, this, um, um, of, uh, of these proteins. So I, I think there, there, will be, there might be viral reservoirs in a way um, and ongoing replication in some form. If that is really driving, if that is important for any form of, or if this is this, if this means this is infectious virus, it's very very difficult to to culture virus from um, feces or intestinal samples. Probably this this will be very low level, so I think infectiousness might not be a very big issue. But um, if these like immuno the immunological reasons um, that could be behind this uh, and driving. Um, not only affinity maturation, but maybe perturbations in general uh, that could also have some form of um, um, morbidity or some effect on disease. Um, I think that's an open question. And that's these, these, these viral persistence, um, viral reservoirs, I think is a, is a topic that needs to be studied much further. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Neville Kleins. Um, Neville, um, you should be able to ask your question. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you could just comment on uh, the possible importance of the order of uh, in natural infection, then vaccine versus vaccine, and then natural infection. Yeah, um, so I think what, what we're seeing is across the board that three antigen exposures, be it through vaccination or through one, one of them being an actual infection and then having uh, on top of that immunizations really improves the, the quality and um, not only the quality, but also the quantity of our immune response to SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the order, we have not really in depth studied the other way around. Um, so most of our individuals that we looked at have been infected during the first wave and then subsequently be um, immunized. Uh, I think right now we're seeing a large scale experiment with, with extremely high numbers of um, at least infections with Omicron of people who had been vaccinated. 
Um, and so these, these breakthrough infections, comparing them um, not only through maybe different viral variants that caused viral breakthroughs, we, we did collect a lot of people with Delta breakthroughs. Now, obviously, we have, we're very much interested in Omicron and how these compare to these individuals that had been first infected then immunized. I think this is a very interesting question um, that we will, that we're looking into and that we will look into, um, but I don't have a really good answer how important that is um, or how it really affects quality uh, or on a mono monoclonal or on a molecular level. Um, I can't really speak to that yet, but it's that will be something we will be looking into. Um, we have a question from um, Nancy Green. Uh, Nancy, you should be able to ask your question. Uh, thank you. That was a, a beautiful talk. And um, one of the things that um, was striking is the use of the canonical um, antibodies, um, both, it, look, it's, it looked like both from vaccine and from virus, but I perhaps I misunderstood your data, but you know, the, the, the canonical antibodies um, raises a question in my mind about whether uh, the spike protein or some elements of it are uh, a super antigen? And if so, then, you know, what, what do you think would be the implications of that for in, uh, immunity and, and, and endurance of that immunity? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think it's, it's now really widely and it's, it's, it's absolutely correct. So this, this early after infection, when we, when we saw this convergent evolution, um, and also at this point, uh, not a lot of somatic hypermutation has taken place. So it's these public clonotypes um, are very close to, to germline encoded antibody repertoire genes. Um, so in order to get SARS-CoV-2 specificity, our immune system can actually readily um, access some of those public clonotypes that many, many of us have. Um, and um, which I think in, in a way is a good sign. And we already know the overrepresentation of certain heavy and light chain genes um, that are present in those public clonotypes. Um, of sort the spike protein being a super antigen I, I i have not really thought about it in that way but it's 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 a it's a good point and um it's a good point yeah. 